Welcome to SCOTUScast, a project of the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. Our contributors join us from around the country to bring you expert commentary on U.S. Supreme Court cases as they are argued and decisions are issued. The Federalist Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Thank you for joining us for this post-argument episode of SCOTUScast. I'm your host, Grace Gottschlin. On June 1st, 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court issued its decision in the case GE Energy Power Conversion France SAS versus Odu Kampu Stainless USA LLC. By a vote of 9-0, to the Supreme Court reversed and remanded the judgment of the 11th Circuit. Justice Thomas, writing for the court, held that the Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards does not conflict with domestic equitable estoppel doctrines that permit the enforcement of arbitration agreements by non-signatories to those agreements. Justice Sotomayor filed a concurring opinion. And now, to discuss the case, we have Sadie Blanchard, Associate Professor of Law at the University of Notre Dame. GE Energy v. Otakumpu is the latest in a line of Supreme Court cases drawing the boundaries of arbitration. Over the last several decades, an increasing number of contracts have provided that disputes will be resolved by arbitration. As these arbitration agreements have become more commonly used, the courts have been asked to interpret them, to decide when someone has agreed to arbitration, and has therefore given up his right to access courts for particular disputes. This case involves a contract dispute between a French arm of General Electric and an Alabama steel plant. The Supreme Court granted cert to address how to interpret a treaty called the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards. First, some background on the New York Convention. By signing this treaty, the United States agreed that its courts will enforce agreements to arbitrate that have an international dimension, such as when one party to the arbitration agreement is a foreign entity. The Federal Arbitration Act gives federal courts jurisdiction to enforce these international arbitration agreements to the extent that the court's actions do not conflict with the New York Convention. This case raised the question whether it conflicts with the New York Convention when a U.S. court applies equitable estoppel to compel a party to arbitrate. Equitable estoppel can be applied to allow a person who is not a party to an arbitration agreement to force a party to that agreement to arbitrate a dispute. The arbitration agreements in question here were contained in contracts between the appellee in this case, Otokumpu, which owned a steel plant in Alabama, and a machinery manufacturer. Under these contracts, the machinery manufacturer was to build new mills for Otokumpu's steel plant. The manufacturer in turn subcontracted with the appellant in this case, GE Energy, to provide motors for the mills. The motors that GE Energy provided allegedly failed and Otakumpu sued GE Energy in U.S. courts. The Supreme Court is taking the facts as they are presented from the lower courts. By assumption, the subcontractor, GE Energy, was not a party to the contracts under which it is being sued. The contracts that Otakumpu is relying on to sue GE Energy are contracts between Otakumpu and the machinery manufacturer, not between Otakumpu and GE Energy. Those contracts contained arbitration clauses. So on that basis, GE Energy asked the district court to dismiss the lawsuit and compel arbitration. Otakumpu objected that GE Energy could not invoke the arbitration clauses in those contracts because GE Energy was not a party to them. Here's where GE Energy's estoppel argument comes in. In a nutshell, the argument is this. If Otakumpu wants to claim that we are liable for breaching contracts between itself and the machinery manufacturer, then Otakumpu cannot deny that the arbitration clauses in those contracts also apply to us. 
In response, Otakumpu argued that the New York Convention does not permit courts to apply equitable estoppel to enforce an international arbitration agreement. The New York Convention, according to this argument, requires an arbitration agreement in writing. Equitable estoppel, on the other hand, is by definition used to force a party to arbitrate when there is no arbitration agreement in writing between the disputing parties. The Supreme Court disagreed. In a unanimous decision, it applied well-established principles of treaty interpretation. It concluded that there is no conflict between the New York Convention and applying equitable estoppel to compel arbitration. The court's key reason for its conclusion is simple. The New York Convention sets a floor for enforcing arbitration agreements, not a ceiling. It requires the courts to enforce agreements that are within the convention's scope, but it does not prohibit them from also enforcing agreements on other grounds. In reaching this conclusion, the court found the treaty's text dispositive. The text contains no language constraining courts' powers to enforce arbitration agreements. Indeed, the treaty states that it shall not deprive any party of enforcement rights under domestic law. While the court's conclusion could rest on treaty text alone, it found, other factors confirm it. The treaty was drafted against the backdrop of existing domestic laws. Some of those pre-existing laws permitted non-signatories to compel arbitration. The convention's drafting history also confirmed that its purpose was to create a floor for enforcing arbitration agreements. In addition, the understandings of other treaty members after ratifying the treaty provide more evidence of its meaning. Courts in other contracting countries have held that domestic law can serve as a basis for enforcing arbitration agreements under the convention. So the court held that the New York Convention presents no barrier to compelling arbitration on equitable estoppel grounds. The court reversed the Court of Appeals and remanded the case for a determination of whether equitable estoppel does allow GE Energy in these circumstances to enforce the arbitration agreements. Justice Sotomayor filed a concurrence to emphasize that arbitration is grounded in consent. Indeed, a fundamental principle of the law of arbitration is that parties must have agreed to arbitrate. She notes that she wonders whether, in this case, any non-signatory doctrine even needs to be applied because the original contracts in which Otakumpu agreed to arbitrate state that its counterparty shall be understood to include subcontractors such as GE Energy. This is a good point. It would seem that applying estoppel to compel a party to arbitrate with a non-party to its arbitration agreement pushes the boundaries of consent. Justice Sotomayor wants to reinforce the consensual foundation of arbitration. This is an issue that has come before her on the bench before in different forms. Her arbitration opinions suggest that she is concerned that parties, especially consumers and workers, will be forced into arbitration without having knowingly agreed to it. For example, she wrote an opinion on the Second Circuit concluding that users of the web browser Netscape had not agreed to an arbitration clause in Netscape's terms of use because the users did not have meaningful notice of those terms. She also joined Justice Kagan's dissent in Lamps Plus v. Varela. The dissent there expressed concern that the majority had failed to interpret the agreement according to the consent expressed in the contract, as interpreted using background principles of contract law. The dissent argued that the majority was imposing a form of arbitration based on policy judgments instead of focusing on consent. In Justice Sotomayor's concurrence in this case, we hear echoes of this concern and an expectation that it will come before the court again. Thank you for listening to this episode of SCOTUScast. SCOTUScast is a project of the Federalist Society, a not-for-profit educational organization of conservative and libertarian law students, law professors, and lawyers, founded upon the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, 
and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast series, including SCOTUScast and Practice Group Podcasts, on iTunes or Google Play. For an archive of past podcasts, as well as audio and video of past Federalist Society events, please visit our website at fedsoc.org slash multimedia. That's F-E-D-S-O-C dot org slash multimedia. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 